Hi, welcome to New Covenant Ministries Church. I'm your host, Pastor Gary Hooper. You know, Jesus was teaching his disciples in John 8, 31, 32. He said, if you continue in my word, you'll be my disciples indeed. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So let's get a little bit more freedom activated in our lives today as we go into the service. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Because I remember one time hearing Jerry Seville at a pastor's conference and, and he was saying that he just, uh, at that time, he, he just wished that God would turn, you know, give him back dollar for dollar. Never, never mind that. You know, and, and he was expressing how some people feel sometimes. He wasn't talking about the way that it really is. But sometimes we get... Um, what some people would call impatient. You know, because, you know, it is seed plus time equals harvest, unless it's Amos 9.13, in which case God can do that quickly as well. But in chapter uh, 11 of Ecclesiastes, in verse 1, he says, cast your bread upon the water, or upon the waters, and that's moving water, it's a type of the Holy Spirit. And he says, he tells us further about this over in, in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 28, it says that we don't work to make a living, we work to give. Because when we work to give, what you, what you can earn during the week is nothing compared to what God can do for you. You know, you don't make enough to live the way God wants you to live. Well, it, let me just, can I take a minute on this? You, I should might want to sit down. But I, you know, but I remember the first time I ever went into a really nice store in Dallas with Mylon and Christy Lefebvre. And I walked into that store and I did not feel like I belonged there. None of you have ever experienced this. I'm just telling you how I felt. You know, like shirts and coats and the prices of things and I'm looking at them and even the clerk made me feel like I didn't belong there. And I'm thinking this $7 an hour clerk is making me feel like I don't belong here. But I heard the Lord say this, and you need to know this about God. Because one time we were talking here about, about uh, the rich guy with the funny hair, um, Donald Trump. <laughs> no, no, Donald Trump flew his son to France in his own jet, and his jet is a 757, it cost him $80,000 to fill the plane with fuel just to go play golf with his son. Now, you know, you know, so if you're like Judas, you'd say, well, that money should have been given to the poor. But if you think like Jesus, Jesus is trying to point out to you, hey, I'm bigger than Donald Trump. Like, I'm your God. So this is what the Lord spoke to me in that store. He said, there's nothing, now he's saying this to everyone, there's nothing in here that would equal the value of you, the price that... I paid for you, Jesus said, was my life. There's nothing in here that they could wrap you in. Amen. Amen. No, no, you know, some people, well, I wouldn't want a nice car like that. People might talk about me. I pray that you get such a nice car, such a nice house, that people do talk about you. Amen. They'll say, how did they do that? They don't make enough money to do that. Seed time, nervous time. Because God's good. No, no, we look at things and we back off them because we have this poverty mentality that we don't want to admit to. And God is saying, hey, I own the universe. The reason why I made the streets in heaven out of gold and the gates out of pearl was so that you could look and see thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, not so that you'd get there someday and go, golly, look at all this. Bunch of hillbillies in heaven. <laughs> you belong there. See, this is the lie of the devil to us, is we don't belong. 
No, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And Romans 8, 17 says that you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. Everything belongs to you. If you only knew it, Ephesians 1, 3 says, I've already blessed you with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly in Christ. Go holy. No, none of that. None of that. You can't wear clothes good enough for you. You can't drive a car good enough for you if you only knew who you were. Well, he said not to covet. We're not coveting. We're looking for our inheritance. You're not coveting something that belongs to you. How can you covet something that belongs to you? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The cattle on a thousand hills and the taters underneath. Genesis 13, 2, and Abraham. Now, no, no, back it up, all the way back to Galatians 3, 29. If any man be in Christ, he's Abraham's seed and heirs of this promise. Genesis 13, 2, and Abraham was very rich. Richer than Donald Trump rich. Solomon, there's never been anyone any richer. Those are God's people. Amen. Hmm. Amen. We better stop. I have a message. <laughs> Let's say this. Psalm 35, 27 says. I'm shouting for joy. I'm glad. I favor his righteous cause. I continually say. Let the Lord be magnified. He takes pleasure in my prosperity. In my tongue will speak of his righteousness. And his praise all the day long. Third John 2 says, God's number one concern for me is that I will prosper, that I will be in health as my soul prospers. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, He's given me this power to get wealth, to establish his covenant in the earth. Now, Ecclesiastes 11.2 says, <laughs> well, I, I was going to say that. Now, I forgot I was going to read this. See, he said, cast your bread upon the waters or the, the moving of the Spirit of God. And he said, it'll come back in many days, after many days. Then in verse 2, he says, give a portion to seven or eight. In other words, don't focus on your circumstances. <laughs> Verse 3, if the clouds be full of rain, this is the verse I wanted you to see. If the clouds are full, what's going to happen? It's going to rain. Matter of fact, he goes on and says, if a tree falls toward the north or the south, he's just using natural illustrations. He said, you can be sure the tree's going to fall. You can be sure that when the cloud gets full of rain, it will fall. And so I like to look at it this way. I, I like to think that this seed that I have in my hand right now could be the one. You know, that suddenly it's going to be a frog strangling rainstorm in my finances. I must believe that or I wouldn't come. You know, sometimes we come and praise God because we want to. And other times we come and praise God because we have to. Sometimes we give and we sow seed because we want to. And sometimes we just have to because we need a harvest. Amen. So it's okay to do that. So thank you, Lord, for casting our seed upon the move of the Spirit of God. After, hey, it's been many days. He's coming back to me now on every wave. Amen. Let's, let's get faith and put it in the now. True confidence is you know you have it. You know you have it. I got 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 it. Come on, girl. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's go in the Bible, shall we? Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 because we've been talking about the teaching of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount, we found out that it wasn't to, it wasn't to the multitude, but it was to the Talmudim or to his disciples, they came to him privately to get some private instruction on how to be a proper 
dis- disciple or a disciplined one. And so he began to instruct them. And we've looked, I think the first one is blessed are the poor in spirit. And we talked about how it's in spirit because there's no blessing in being poor. Then he goes on and he says, blessed are they that mourn. And we found out that's not, that's not discouragement or shame or embarrassment. That's, that's something that will cause you to turn your back, turn your face rather toward the Lord. So then the next one was, no, the blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. And we found out that the meek is, Moses was the meekest man on earth. So we found out that meekness isn't weakness. It's strength under control. And it's the ability to receive from somebody greater than you. It's like, you know, lots of times we'll work and we'll try to take care of our own things and manage our affairs, and that's all good as long as I make sure that I got my faith in God and not my ability to, to take care of things. That's why he gave us Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, that we would trust in him with all of our hearts, not lean on our own way of doing things, but acknowledge him and he would direct, come on, he would direct our steps. Wouldn't you like to be directed by the Lord, see? When you're directed by the Lord, you're going to make out Okay. Things are going to turn in your favor. Amen. So then the, the fourth one, and the, and the one that I think that's key for these first four, are all about input. So that I can be effective in the kingdom of God for him to advance his kingdom. So, But the fourth one is, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst, hunger for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I think it's really cool that he would use hunger and thirst because what he's saying to you is you can be continually satisfied, but you'll never be completely satisfied as long as you're hungry for the Lord. Like, you know, you come in here in church and, and you hear the Word of God, and if you come 52 times a year, uh, every Sunday, uh, I get 52 hours to preach to you. So, in other words, two days out of 365, if you happen to be really bold and come on a Wednesday, we can double that number, but it's still not very much. So all that a pastor's job is, is to provoke you to go and create an, to create an appetite in you so that you can go home and study the Bible for yourself. So that you can go home and get good teaching uh, material, and it's so readily available now and so free everywhere that you know, that you can, that you can grow yourself up, like to assume the responsibility for taking care of yourself. And so, so after you go through those four, then we looked at last week at blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And we found out that mercy is just, it's kindness that's manifest to those in need. It's a readiness that you and I have to help other people. Right? But then the next one, the next one is so powerful because he says, blessed are the pure in heart. And what's the reward in that? They shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And the word uh, pure there is cardia. And you know, cardia is your heart, of course, but it, it means to be single in purpose. It means that you're not pretending. <laughs> but it also means, what is the word, Nancy, that for when you cleanse a wound? It's, it's from the, this card. Yeah, cauterized. So that word is also used in purity. And so he's talking about how we cleanse ourselves. Now, now you should not ever receive any condemnation in a message like this because, because, you know, when you come in from working, you want to have a shower. It, why? Because you feel dirty and you want to cleanse yourself. When you feel dirty... You don't run away from home and say, I'm not ever going near that shower again. Why is it that people treat church like that? No, no, if I, I've been out in the world all week, and I just want you to give me a shower, Pastor. No, you know, I just want you to clean me up. I, I, I came in and I got some dirt on me. I walked through the junkyard and I got the smell in my clothes. I just want to get cleaned up. You know, because I feel so good when I'm clean. How many of you know that? How many of you know a shower? The dirtier you are, the better you feel when you get cleaned up. See, if we could just approach the Word of God like that. Jesus said, you're now clean through the Word that I've spoken unto you. He said in uh, John 15 and verse 2. But then he talked about the bride of Christ you know, over in Ephesians chapter 5. And he said, it's by the washing of the water of the Word of God. So, every time, so, so, you know, you, so just think about it though. If you only come to church on Sunday and you don't read the Bible all week, we can smell you when you're coming in. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Especially if you've been way out there in the world, you know. You know, it's because you haven't showered at home. 
No, no, we were. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, we got to break. We got to break it down to where we live, and to realize that God is just trying to clean us up. He doesn't have some kind of, you know, vengeance against us. And when He gives rules and commandments, it's like, it's like to keep you out of the ditch. It's like when you see that big sign in red and white and it says, wrong way, that means that is not an on-ramp, that's an off-ramp. But if you see that sign and say, well, they just don't want me to have any fun, you're dead. See, so we just need to treat the Word of God the same way. Hey, this is, this is my navigation system. This is how I negotiate my way through life. And if I, found out where, if I can find out where I went off, I can get back on. But if I get off and say, well, I guess I'm just off. And just keep driving in the wrong direction, after a while you're going to end up so far away, you don't know, how did I ever get here? You didn't get back on. You didn't just, and it was so easy to get back on. It's easy to get back on. It's only, no, no, but especially with men, men will not stop anywhere and ask for directions. No, no, you can be as lost as a goose in a hailstorm, but you are not. Nancy said, why don't you stop over there and ask that guy? He's not, I, said, I don't need to ask anybody. <laughs> and we do the same thing with God. God is saying, hey. And Bob does the same thing. Diane was just pointing thumbs at him over there. <laughs> you, you know, so, but it, what, what is it? It's pride. Pride saying, well, I mean, you know, then, then your wife's going to tell you something and you don't want to hear that either. And so the, here's God. He's, saying, he's nudging you on the inside. But anyway, let's move on from there. Let's get away from that and over to Proverbs 4.23 before I get myself in trouble. No, no, because when I preach something like this, then later on in the week when I mess up, Nancy will be saying, remember what you said on Sunday? <laughs> Well, let's pick it up in Proverbs 4. Verse 20 is so good because he said, My son, uh, attend to my word. Incline your ear to my sayings. In other words, don't... Uh, he, he, what he said, if you, if you, if, let me, can I just give you the Hooper version of this? Don't apply the word to your life. Apply your life to the word. You know, so I'm going to focus on the word here. And I've had times when the phone would be ringing, people would be texting me and everything, and I've made a discipline in my life that, hey, when I'm on the Word, nothing's going to disturb me. I'm not going to answer the door. If you're knocking on the door, you think of rude. I've had people, one time I was in here praying one morning, and somebody came in and said, hi, Pastor, and I just kept right on walking. Why? Because I was talking to somebody else. I wasn't trying to be rude, but I was not going to let them interrupt me. I had, I had a conversation with my father going on, and so they probably thought, well, who does he think he is? No, it was nothing to do with you. You didn't, just didn't see the other person I was talking to. <laughs> you know. So attend to the word, he said. Don't let it depart from before your eyes. Why? Keep them. Protect it in the middle of your where? In the middle of your where? Your heart. How do I get my heart pure? By keeping the word in the middle of your heart. What does it produce? Life. Life and health to all of my flesh. Life and health, I can walk in life and in health if I just take enough of this medicine. If I can just take my medicine. You know, a doctor will write your other prescription, you can't even tell what he read, but it says four times a day, and you just go and you do it. You do it, you do it. God's saying, attend to my word, and saying, well, I'll get around to it. No, if you knew how important it was, if you knew how important it was to your life. So then he gets down to verse 23, and he says, keep your heart with all diligence. Keep it. That's that same word. Protect it. Guard it. Guard your inner self above all things so that life and health will be manifested to you. The word cleanses you. Come on. You know when it says that the Bible, that, that the word of God will make you white as snow? He's not talking about a, a skin tone. He's talking about white is really not a color. There's no discoloration in you. So he's saying, he's saying, I want to get rid of all the discoloration in you. He said, I want to catarize you. I want to cleanse you from impurity. And I want to make sure that you're free from guilt and single in purpose. That's what it's all about, being free from guilt. You ought not to ever have a guilty conscience. 
not ever. I mean, we'll get, maybe we'll get there to Hebrews chapter 10, but he, says, he said you need to have a pure conscience. You could just have a pure conscience. And, and you can keep it pure as long as you stay in the now. If you go back to what you did or ahead to what you might do. No, you need to stay in right now. Right now you're in the presence of God. He's just tickled with you. He'd like to grab you by the cheek and say, aren't you my sweetheart? You know, That's who God is. You know, and you know, if you came into his house dirty, come on, Hebrews 4:16, come boldly onto the throne room of grace to obtain mercy and to find grace to help when, when you need it. You come to the house. If you go to your father's house and say, Dad, I just need a shower, he's going to pass you the soap. If you really need a shower, he's liable to pass you a load of it. But he's not ever going to say, No, you can't, no, there's no, it's over for you. No, he's saying, come on, let, let me, let's get cleaned up and let's go sit at the table and let's talk about your day. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, let's go to Proverbs 23.7. Proverbs 23.7 is a verse I've preached a lot because it's only found this one time in the Word. And I'm thinking, man, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those truths that God really wants us to get a hold of, but He only placed it here one time. Just the first part of the verse says this, For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So who you are is what you think about. The quality of your life, we could say it this way, is determined by the quality of your thought life. This is why he gave us Romans 12, 2. And when you think about Romans 12, 2, he's saying, renew your mind. Go back to a state of the way that it was before it got polluted by the world or by some ugly person would say in something to you, or go back to the way that God originally intended for your mind to be. So, but here, one translation says it this way, Proverbs 23, 7. As he is all along in his heart, so he is at last in his life. As he is all along in his heart, so at last he is in his life. How you see yourself. So, and we've talked before, you're not limited by genetic determinism or psychic determinism or environmental determinism. It doesn't, it's not about your education. It's not about where you came from. It's not about I'm like this because my father was. You've got heavenly DNA in you now. So it's got nothing to do with that. It's got nothing to do with any of that. It's not about education. It's not about family. It's not about location. Thinking in negative terms always produces negative results. The world has figured this out. The power of positive thinking. No, no, you need to be, you know, you cannot, I remember, again, Ed Dufresne taught me this, and I've, I've said it with, to you many times. He said, a troubled heart is an unbelieving heart. So when you, this is why Jesus said, let, you, not, let not your heart be troubled. When you find your heart being troubled, move over onto something positive. You know, I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Get enough word in you so that you can answer those negative thoughts. You know. That's all you've got to do. Amen. Hi, Pastor Gary Hooper here. Uh, glad to, to hook up with you in your home or on your phone or however you've connected with us today. I'm reading uh, from uh, Paul's last letter to the church at Corinth, and the final verse is very interesting because he said, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And of course, that word communion is the word koinonia in the Greek, and it means partnership, fellowship, intimacy, responsibility. It means all of that means that they were collectively working together. Like Paul said in Romans 1.14, they had a debt to win the lost at any cost. And so if you'd be interested in partnering up with us to advance his kingdom, the information will be appearing on your screen. And uh, God bless you. To become a covenant partner with us or to make a donation, please visit our website at www.newcovenantchurch.ca or phone us toll free at 1-866-296-WORD. That's 1-866-296-9673.
So the, quali- so the quality thinking, we can say it this way. Break down Proverbs 23, 7. Quality thinking equals quality life. <laughs> but many of us look through a distorted mirror. Like Mephibosheth that we talked about last week. You know, Mephibosheth over in 2 Samuel chapter 9. His name was shameful thing. He ran away from a king that he thought was trying to kill him, not understanding that he had a covenant, and he saw himself like a dead, lame dog. <laughs> this is not who he was. This is who he thought he was. He had a distorted mirror. He looked in the mirror and he couldn't see. See, this is the, the only mirror that will tell you the truth about you is this one. No, no, somebody might have held up an, an ugly mirror to you when you're, when you're very little. You'll never amount to anything. You'll never do good. You'll probably end up in jail. You're this, you're that, you're the other thing. You, you know, or pull a religion deal on you and just make you feel like you're ashamed of yourself all the time because, because you did something wrong. Because you do things wrong doesn't make you wrong. So a distorted mirror is really a dis, a just it's a faulty belief system. Is what it is. And so this is why we have the Bible, so that we can correct all that. Well, let's go to James chapter 1 because he talks a lot about the mirror over there. Probably the best chapter on this subject. Right after Hebrews, we're going to find James. I like the whole chapter. Verse 22 is really good because he said, Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only, to deceive in your own self. And that word doer there is, we taught about it on Wednesday night in the, Roman, in the book of Romans. Uh, poeo, but this word here is a root is from the root poeo, doer of the word. But it's the word poetes, where we get the word poet. And a poet is somebody that creates with words. And so what he, when he's saying be a doer of the word, he's saying use the word of God to create your future. No, it's like I said on Facebook the other day. You know, you uh, you need to learn how to speak God's language in order to communicate with Him. When you don't know how to speak God's language, which is his word, you're just goo goo, ga ga, da da, blah, blah, blah. You're not communicating. When I was a child, I understood as a child, Paul the Apostle said. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. He said, I learned how to grow up and begin to speak the word of God, how to speak right. Because speaking, the, the words that you're speaking today are planting your future. Words are seeds. He taught us all about it in Mark chapter 4. And he said, if you don't understand this parable, you won't understand any of them. So you got to get a hold of this truth. So he's saying, be a creator. Be a creator like your father. Verse 22, be a creator of the word. Not a hearer only. Don't be self-deceived. Verse 23, for a hearer of the word and not a doer is like a man that looks in the mirror, in his, at his natural face in the mirror. But again, as you look in the mirror, remember what Proverbs 23, 7 says. As I am in my heart, so I'll, last, I'll be in my life. So, I need to, so if I'm not seeing myself correctly, I need to change things, right? <laughs> For he beholds himself, verse 24. He beholds himself and he goes away and straight away he forgets what kind of man he was. He, you know, it says he neglects the nature and the quality of the man that he is to be. So when I look in my Bible, I see who I am. I'm prosperous. I'm successful. I'm meditating His Word day and night. I have a full supply of the Spirit. I, you know, all of the, the, the earth belongs to me because I'm an heir of God. And so I, I'm not after a little piece of it. I want the whole thing. <laughs> you know? And, and so, it, it, again, it just begins. So I cannot neglect the nature so I guess we could say it this way too. If I'm going to change my life, if I don't like where I am on April the 13th, 2014, and I keep thinking the same way, then when I get to 15, I'll be in the same place. But you see, I believe 14, the number 14, you know, from the Bible, I believe 14 is powerful because 14 is when Jericho fell down, the seven priests, the seven rams, horns, all that. There's a whole bunch of things that, that are going to happen in my life this year because I'm believing the Word of God. You know, so, you know, you came through last year, but you got to believe God that this year is a, a year of change. And so, in order to, for change to happen, I need to, insti- I need to initiate it. See, 
It's like I can't conquer what I can't confront, and I can't confront what I don't define. So I got to see something that's holding me back, and then I need to confront that thing. I need to define it, and then I can get past it. But I just, you know, again, you can't, it's easy to be a victim. It's the easiest thing in the world to be a victim. It's the church's fault. It's my boss's fault. You mean to tell me you had 10 jobs in the last five years and it's the boss's fault? No, you have a problem. You, you got to face that. But see, as long as you continue to be a victim, God called you to be a victor to conquer those situations. You know, that you, you're the light that goes into those places. So it's not your church. It's not your boss. It's not your spouse. It's none of the above. If you don't like where you are, it's you that have got to change it. But as long as you're a victim, you won't never stand up and fight for anything. You just say, oh well, and blame somebody else. Play the blame game just like Adam. It was my wife's fault and it was your fault because you gave her to me. <laughs> it's always God's fault when things don't work out. Ultimately, it goes back to God. They blame Moses, but it was really God. Moses is interesting, they couldn't stand the guy, but then after he died, they spent 30 days at his funeral. <laughs> okay, so verse 24 again, he says, he looks in the mirror and he goes away and forgets what he looked like. Verse 25, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, talking about the word, and continues therein, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, that man shall be blessed in his deeds. So, no, but what it says to me is I'm responsible. I can't be a victim. I, I've got to assume responsibility for my life. You and I, we need to assume responsibility. Let's go to, uh, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. You hear fast, and I'll talk fast, and we'll get out of here, okay? <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's spring out there for the first time since whenever. <laughs> 1 and verse 5, Timothy 1, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 5. Now, the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and faith on faith. I think it's the uh, message translation says, love uncontaminated by self-interest and no counterfeit faith, but we're open to the life of God. Chapter 3 and verse 9. Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. Now your conscience, you know... <laughs> Well, just keep your hand there. I just want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 1 for a second. In verse 3, this is Paul the Apostle who murdered Stephen and many others. He was there. He consented with the deaths of many, he said. He arrested people and threw them in jail. But listen to what he says here in verse 3 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. I thank my God whom I serve from my forefathers with what? A pure conscience. So if he could clear his conscience, don't tell me you can't clear yours. Huh? In 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 2, you don't need to turn there, but he told the Corinthian church, he said, receive us, we have wronged no man. Well, up until his, up until his Damascus experience, he wronged everybody he ever came in contact with. He was, he was a monster. He was a, an insane religious zealot that would rather kill people that didn't agree with him. You know, so, so yet he's saying here he has a pure conscience. Over in verse 12, he says, nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. To me, that's total freedom. See, God wants you free. This is what he wants. This is why he told us in, in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. What he's saying is, I can't release my faith because I have a guilty conscience. God wants you to walk in faith. He doesn't want you feeling guilty. He doesn't want you feeling ashamed. And, how, and, and so, again, if, I'm, if I get dirty, I have a shower. I don't quit and say, well, that, uh, just this, this, this living's too hard. You get dirty here on the earth. How ridiculous would that be? But we, I've seen people do it at church all the time. Well, I'm not, I just can't do that. I'm not going back there anymore. 
What do you mean? You can't get clean? (laughs) No, even Malachi says God's word is like a fuller soap. You know, he said, he said, he said, it'll lather you up, man. It's good for you. How many of you don't like to have a show? No, we won't ask that. Okay. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 then. In verse 22, it says, flee also youthful lusts. And again, you know, when you read lust, don't think about, you know, a man chasing a woman. It's a whole lot more than that. Lust is, lust is covetous. You know, covetousness is a fruit of that. There's several fruit to that. It could be a lust after money, a lust after material things. But he says, follow. I like this, follow your righteous position in Christ. Follow that. Walk that out. Walk it out. Faith and love or charity, peace with those that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So keep company with those that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Simple, isn't it? Who am I keeping company with? That's all. You know, I want to be around people that are going to build me up, not tear me down. Don't you? Well, except here on the pastoral staff. It's a little bit different with myself and Paul and Scott, but... We believe in edification instead of edification. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. Well, this whole chapter 10 of Hebrews is so powerful. Um, he said, let us draw near. Doesn't say let us run away. Let us draw near. There's three lettuce verses here, 22, 23, and 24. Let us draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and look at this, and our bodies washed with pure water. See, so your evil conscience was gone by the blood of Jesus. And so now you're just cleaning up your walk. Like we said in John chapter 13, Jesus washed the disciples' feet because it's the only thing that contacts the earth. He said, you don't need to be washed all over, Peter. You just need your walk maintained. That's all it was about. So so verse uh, 23, he said, let us hold fast our profession of faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Promised. Hmm. So, I, so, you know, this is powerful truth here. Hold fast to your confession of faith. Have your hearts clean from an evil conscience, from a guilty conscience. Don't have a guilty conscience. Refuse a guilty conscience. When a guilty conscience tries to creep on you, say, hey, I turned that over to the Lord. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, and it's a done deal. He forgot about it, and I'm forgetting about it right now. It's amazing how fast he can forget about things. He deletes it from his hard drive. Yeah, and and you don't have enough uh, uh, you don't have enough techie gear to find it again. It's gone. He said, as far as the east is from the west, so far I've removed your sins from you. So you can't even locate it anymore. The only place you can locate it is in your own heart. And God's saying, I want your heart to be pure. I don't want you dragging that stuff around with you. But now, of course, over in Romans chapter 12, you can't talk about a pure heart and a mind without going to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, because it's all about renewing your mind by the Word of God, isn't it? And this, this you know, he, again, he said, don't be conformed to this world, or don't be informed this, by this world, and if all you got is this world's information, you're deformed by this world. But he said, I want you to be transformed, and that's the word metanoia, where we get metamorphosis, and it's talking about something that's changing you from the inside out. Religion wants to focus on the outside. See, you know, we all get in character before we go outside. You ever notice? You know, I I think it was Shakespeare said, the whole world is a stage. But wow, was he ever right on. No, no, we get in character before we get around one another. I gotta make sure, you know. But who who you really are is your character. It's not what we see. 
when you're in character. And God is saying, I don't want you to be in character when you're around brothers and sisters. He said, I want you to be so free that if, if Kyla doesn't like me, it doesn't matter. I mean, I love her, but if, but if she doesn't like the way I am, well, I can't help it. I'm just so happy. I'm just so happy being me. I'm so free that it doesn't matter. No, this is what Jesus, it's what God said to the, to the Apostle Paul. He said, he said I, I, I'm freeing you from the people that I'm sending you to. So that you can keep a pure conscience. You can stay happy because your happiness is not dependent on them. Your happiness is inside. And so when you're happy inside, people reigning on the outside is not going not gonna to bother you. It's like, see, he said, I want you that free. That's how Jesus was. Jesus was so free that they were trying to stone him and he just, mm, I think I'll go somewhere else. The Bible says he passed through the midst of them. It was like he had a cloaking device. You can't even see me now, can you? <laughs> I'm out of here. I'll go find somebody that likes me and you have a nice day. Amen. So, but here he says that, that I'm to renew my mind and that renew is anachinosis and and. It, 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 it's like it, it literally talking. I think what he's talking about here is you need to go back to the original condition of your mind. I'm not talking about when you were born on the earth. I'm talking about when you're in heaven before you were ever sent here. Before you were ever knit together in your mother's womb, there, there's a mind that you have that's available to you. And that mind is in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 through 28 where God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. <laughs> you know, image is about character and likeness is about function. So God is saying, I made you in my character and I made you to function like me. That is your, that, that's the mind that he wants to get you back to. So that you think like him, you talk like him, you act like him. And it's not some religious put on, it's, it's, just this, it's just this knowing, this confidence, you know, this confidence like John 5, 14, where he says, this is the confidence knowing that we have, knowing that we have, so that it doesn't matter what you're seeing, you always know that you got it. You always know you got it, you got it, you got it, because he gave it to you. So. so, you know, but again, so he's, you know, it's like, Somebody may look at you in the world and say, well, you're just not worth, like that woman in the store, you, you know, you're not worthy to be in here. Yeah, take, take a deeper look. <laughs> Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Take, take, take a deeper look at me. Just don't look and judge what you're seeing on the outside. There's something greater on the inside of me. Take another look. You need to turn around and tell people, take another look, man. <laughs> No, see, but he wants you to get to, he said, I want you to see me. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. He said, I want you to get to the place that you can see me, but I'm not up there. I'm right here. He's inside of you. He, he's not on cloud 13. We love reading Ephesians chapter 1. That, that he raised Christ from the dead and seated him in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion. But you just got to read 2, 6 and think about it. And he raised us up together and seated us together with him in a king's authority. Whew. No, this is what the devil doesn't want you to get. This is why he always wants you to be looking at you and thinking you're just not worthy. He, you know, you're just, you're just not, you don't have a pure heart. No, no, I can purify my heart anytime I can just read the Bible and just let it wash on over me. And there, I'm clean again. My heart's already been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, and so my heart's clean. I'm just cleaning up my walk by, with the pure water, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. He's cleaning it up. He's staying clean. I'm staying clean because I, I, see, I, I, I see that God's character has been resident on the inside of me. How do I know that? Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. And against that, there's no law. It's already in me. So Philippians 2.12 says, work out, work out, work out that kingdom authority that's in you. He said, you've been made in my image and in my likeness that you would have dominion over the earth. 
See, God's intention for the church is to have dominion over the earth. The mountain, the, the stone cut without hands, Daniel talked about, the virgin birth cut without hands, shall become a great mountain and fill the whole earth. See, it, people, so much of the church is focused on, well, just, just a few of us now, God, if you could just pull us out of here and call it the rapture of the church and just take us on home because this world is too ugly. No, this, this world was put here so that you could change it for the better, so that the blessing would begin to flow through you and out into your community, but you got to begin to see it. What does a pure heart look like? I'm going to stop on this next verse. I'm serious. I'm stopping on this next set of verses. First Corinthians chapter two. First <laughs> Corinthians, where is that? It's in the Bible, isn't it? First Corinthians chapter two. Now remember we just read Timothy chapter uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3 that Paul said, I served God from my forefathers with a pure conscience. And the cool thing about that is he's saying, from the time of my fathers, I've always been right with God. He realized that ho that whole chunk of his ugly life was removed, just like a cancer cut off his body. He said, I've served God with a pure heart since my forefathers. He said, I ain't never done anything wrong in my life. No, he wants you to think that way. See, because when you think that way, it'll change the way you talk, the way you act, the way you walk. You'll be expecting God to do something for you then because it won't be based on, oh, I hope he does something for sorry me. No, it'll be saying, hey, I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ and I'm expecting, hallelujah, to walk into everything that he provided for me. Huh. So Paul knew this. And so in, in, in chapter 2 and verse 1 of 1 Corinthians, he said, and I, brethren, he's talking to the church, I came to you, he said, I didn't come with fancy speech, proper speech. He said, that wasn't important. He studied it under Gamaliel, I'm sure he probably talked better than I do, but he said, I didn't come with flowery speech trying to impress you with wisdom declaring the testimony of God. He said, I determined I don't know anything except Christ and Him crucified. He said, I was with you in the natural, in weakness and fear and much trembling. And he said, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words trying to lure you into something of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. He said, spirit words from a pure heart. He said, I, I got, I'm releasing some spiritual truth to you from a pure heart. And I'm going to do works that he did in greater works because he went to his father. And I found out that he did three things. He preached and he taught and he worked miracles. And so, you know, you're preaching like right now. I don't understand this, but we're reaching 1.3 million people a day through social media. So that, so you, you, when you think about that and you think about churches of this size around the world that have the same capacity now through the media, you know, how far can we reach and how quick? And so the preaching and the teaching is going out there, and there's only one thing missing. Miracles. And the miracles will happen when people know that they have it. He, he, you know, he said, and, and, you know, he, he, he said, uh, he said uh, I've given you the gifts of the Spirit. Look, he said, I've already given them to you. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, gift of faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning spirits, tongues, the interpretation of tongues. The Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, Paul said, this Corinthian church, he said, you don't come back. You, it went, concerning the gifts, you're ahead of everybody. But the church was in a total mess. One guy was sleeping with his father's uh, wife and all kinds of crazy stuff. And so Paul had to clean that church up. They didn't have the pure heart, but they did have the gifts in operation. Isn't that amazing? See, God's heart is to reach people. He'll reach the world through you if you let him. Um, I can't go any further now because I said it was going to stop here. <laughs> Verse 5, I'll read it one more time. <laughs> God said, your faith won't stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. The power.
power of God that got you saved flowing in you right now. Now, lots of times people think, well, you know, if, if miracles are going to happen, Pastor, when are you going to perform some? Uh, I, I've seen some. Um, my response would be, when are you going to show me some? No, no, my response would be, what are you waiting for? You, you know, there's one thing that he told every believer. Let's think about this. He told every believer this. He said, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He didn't say you had to be a pastor. You didn't have to be saved for six years or any qual. The only qualification was belief and go lay hands on the sick and they recover. Isn't that something? He didn't say bring them to church and get the pastor to pray for them either. He said, you lay hands on the sick and they recover. But what if I do that and they don't? Just do what Oral Roberts said. Next. It's not up to you to make them recover. It's up to you to believe and lay hands on them. And then if you walk away and they look worse, just keep walking. No, keep walking. I remember one time Nancy and I were in the hospital praying for this guy. And I tell you, I couldn't look at him because he was so messed up. He had tubes coming out everywhere and everything. And in the nest, you would look and say, man, we better get out of here before this guy passes away, right? <laughs> I know you've never thought that praying for people. But those thoughts were coming into my mind loud. And so finally, I just had to shut my eyes and went over and prayed for the guy. I prayed for the guy and I did what I felt like I ought to do, split. And when we got home, he, he got up, he was totally healed. It didn't manifest in an hour or two, but over the next 24 hours, he got totally healed. Yeah. Why am I telling you that? Because we felt nothing. We looked at it, and in the natural, it looked like, we, you know, if we stay, we could be a pallbearer here or something, you know, carry this guy out. So we've had several occasions like that. I remember in the Philippines, or in the Philippines, in Ukraine, praying for that blind woman. I didn't know. I'm sitting in the pastor's office, and I'm ready to preach, man. I got my new suit on. I'm sitting there. First time in the Ukraine, first service in the Ukraine. I'm sitting there, nah, 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 nah. And you know, I have an interpreter with me, and so everybody's speaking Russian and Ukrainian, so I don't even know what they're talking about. I'm just sitting there in my own little world, you know. And so then my, my interpreter taps me on the shoulder, and he said, Pastor, she said, Pastor Gregory wants you to pray for this woman. They brought a woman into the office. I said, oh, well, that's, that's cool. What's wrong with her? She, she's, she's blind. <laughs> no, no, I was still jet-lagged from flying all the way over there. I felt nothing. You know, sometimes you can sense an anointing. I sensed nothing. So then I prayed for her. Like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> None of you have ever experienced this. I'm just telling you how I felt at the time. A mighty man of faith and power. You know, and I didn't feel that much power right there. Anyway, I prayed for her. And then she, she went and she started looking at things. And uh, then they asked her, you know, it was just like the Bible story. Can you see? She said, well, things are fuzzy. So... They said, pray again, so I prayed for her again, and she walked out healed. Yeah, yeah. So then, whew, so then, whew, that's over. So then we go down to the Black Sea, the next service. They bring in a deaf woman. I had never prayed for a deaf woman in my life, but I had watched George Moss do this. Open. So I went. <laughs> Open. And she went. Like that. She, she, she was healed. Another time, another time, in, this, in a prayer line over there, they don't have a prayer line. You're standing there and they swarm you. And I'm reaching to pray for Paul, and Shirley grabs my hand and puts it on her head and said she don't want to wait. That's the kind of thing you're dealing with. This one woman came up and she had tumors all up in through her sinuses and everything. And she was going to have to have several operations to get rid of them. They fell out on the floor. They're they gone. And so then you come back home. When, and I called Nancy from there. Vincent, I called Pastor Nancy. I said, Nancy, I love you, but I'm not coming home. Like this is, you know, three o'clock in the afternoon, they're trying to close the service and trying to get me out of there. And I'm saying, don't touch me. This is what I live for. This is, come on, that, that, that presence. And this is what I want you to believe God for here. You know, he's, he's not a respecter of persons. He wants to do that here so that people will come in here desperate. that no hope the doctors give them up and they come in here and they don't get it from me. You turn to them while they're in the service and say, 
and just release healing on you now in Jesus' name. Just like that, and boom, they get healed. And the next thing you know, the reports go around the city, and they're lining up outside the door coming in to get, to get healed. And when they come in, we give them the Word of God, and they get born again. See, that's what, that's what we need. How are we going to get a church of thousands of people? By being Jesus to people. By letting them know that it's not just a word, it's not just a doctrine, but it's a living, powerful truth. Amen. So are you with me? Amen. Pastors Gary and Nancy Hooper, along with their friendly congregation, warmly invite you to join with them at New Covenant Ministries Church in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada. We minister to the whole family with ministry groups for all ages. You'll love the anointed praise and worship, the friendly atmosphere and dynamic teaching of Pastor Gary. Sunday services are held at 10.30 a.m. with midweek services on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at New Covenant Ministries Church, 110 Thorn Avenue in the Burnside Industrial Park in Dartmouth. For more information on our church, other ministries and for products and Christian resources, visit us online at www.newcovenantchurch.ca or phone us toll free at 1-866-296-WORD. That's 1-866-296-9673. Learn to live victoriously. Come visit New Covenant Ministries Church in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada and discover God's plan for your life.